Welcome to this lecture on elections in Africa. This is one of these vexed issues where a very great deal of attention, a very great deal of focus is placed upon these interesting events called elections. So much so that it could be said that elections have been fetishized as representing democracy, whereas that's not necessarily the case. And in terms of democracy, you've actually got an entire other, much wider realm of concern. For instance, you're looking at issues of constitutionalism. You're looking at issues of, for instance, the independence of the judiciary. You're looking for instance, as to whether or not in the context of the elections, the Electoral Commission can be treated or should be treated as part of an independent judiciary. And of course, even before you get to the election day, what you're looking at are the conditions of campaigning, not just in terms of the period of the campaign, but for the entire tenure of the government's term, was the opposition able to oppose in a parliamentary setting? Were they able to conduct their public relations, their rallies, their galvanization of support in a way that was unfettered? Was there, in particular, a free press, a free expression, so that people, not just political parties, could register their ideas, could register their dissent? So all of these questions are among the very, very many that pertain to the whole question of democracy. And in terms of the franchise itself, is there some kind of discrimination in terms of the franchise? Is everybody over a certain age able to participate in a democratic process? What is the registration period? What hindrances might be imposed during the whole process of registration? What well, safeguards against fake registration, inflated registration, the mysterious, as it were, increase in the number of voters on voters' rolls, the veracity of the names and addresses on voters' rolls, whether or not you could even check the addresses in many countries, even many cities, where it's almost impossible to discover for a huge number of people whether or not they've got fixed abode, and where many people live in areas without street names, without street numbers. Uh, how do you know that someone actually lives in a certain location without physically checking out each voter one by one? So even with the best will in the world, all kinds of imponderables hang over elections and all kinds of very, very vexed issues hang over the whole issue of democracy. So that in an emerging situation, in a developing country, democratic practice might also be seen as something that is still in a state of development. This does not mean it should be in a state of being hindered. In other words, a state of development requires a proactive effort to make the entire democratic and the entire electoral process work. Now, as it's turned out, because of the huge increase in election observation, it's almost like a new discipline, a new, as it were, fixture on the scene of African countries. Because of this fixation on the observation of elections, for instance, you're going to have the African Union sending an observer group, the local regional body sending an observer group, you're going to have in the North African country, the Arab League sending an observer group, Anglophonic countries, a Commonwealth observer group, various American observer groups, and basically no end of independent observers and no end of news media. So what you have is a sense of elections being increasingly extremely well organized. It becomes a showpiece. On the day, everything is perfect. You couldn't expect anything to be better conducted. The very, very best elections I've seen anywhere in the world, 
were in Sudan in 2010. Uh, there, what you had was a national exercise involving both North and South shortly before the South gained its independence. A national exercise which was impeccable. Every single polling station, even in the wildest, most remote areas, was equipped properly, staffed properly. Everyone knew what the protocols were. All the queues were there. All the voting information for people coming to vote was there. Party agents were able to operate within X number of meters of the polling stations. Even if the polling station was simply a roped off area underneath a big tree to safeguard people from the sun, everything within that polling station, everything conducted underneath that tree was conducted impeccably. There was a special role for women to ensure a certain percentage of women in parliament. This in the northern part of what was then one Sudan, Khartoum, to ensure, as it were, representation of women in an Islamic country. So you had, as it were, every effort made essentially to use the election not only as a stepping stone to the independence of South Sudan, but also as a validation of President Bashir in the north in the hope of having sanctions removed against him and his regime. So elections can be used for a variety of purposes, and in this case, good and bad reasons were combined. And you had the whole float of electoral observation teams. I headed up one of these, and it was one of these exercises where you simply had a basic executive decision to make. If we saw a Carter sent a car from America, if we saw a European Union car, if we saw any other observer team and their car, we weren't out far enough. We just kept driving, which was a bit of a dodgy executive decision since a very great deal of the area, particularly in South Sudan, was landmined. No problem in terms of the immaculate conduct of the elections. Um, got to get a tourist visa, I thought. Hope they're not going to ask me too many questions about whether I'm there for the election, when patently I was there for the election. I'm quite well known in that country as observing their elections. But ahead of me in the immigration queue was a CNN camera team with their cameras slung over their shoulders. And so they got to the immigration desk and said, can we have tourist visas, please? And the immigration official simply said, yes, you're in. In other words, they were so confident that they were going to run a good election, that they were going to be quite free and open about who could see it. All the conditioning had taken place well before the arrival of the teams of media, the teams of observers, and if need be, a certain amount of conditioning could take place during the count in an arcane way that would not always be visible to these observers and to the media. Don't forget, in any one African election, you're going to have thousands of polling stations. You don't have to fix the result at every single polling station. What you can do is have a selective list of stations which have been largely inaccessible to observers because they're in the wilds. And that's why we went into the wilds in Sudan. Do some quite subtle tailoring of the results there and basically feed that into a national picture so there's just enough to tilt the result in a certain way which would be pleasing to the incumbent government wanting to stay in power. So these things are very much in the realm of certain nuances which are not always appreciated. And in fact, to be perfectly fair to the whole process, the whole process is a newish one. The very first election observation, not just in Africa, but in the world, and had never taken place anywhere before, was in Zimbabwe, then still Rhodesia, in 1980 as the country completed the steps towards a recognized independence. The agreement at Lancaster House, which is where the negotiations for independence after a brutal war of liberation had taken place, those negotiations said that there would be a period in which the guerrilla parties, 
the nationalist parties would be unbanned. They could organize within the country, January, February, 1980. And at the very end of February, 1980, beginning of March, 1980, elections would be held. And those elections would be very, very much determining of the future of the government. Independence would be given on the basis of a free and fair election. So as a very, very young man, I was sent to help organize the observation of the so-called free and fair elections. In the end, they were, I hasten to add. But when I asked my superiors, well, what am I meant to do? You know, how do I do this? And they said, we don't know. No one's ever done this before. I said, are we in possession of maps of the dangerous areas and the landmined areas? Nope, nothing like that. You've got a week to go down as part of a team, an advance guard, to set it all up. One week before the senior observers arrive, you need to have it sorted out before they arrive because they're going to start observing as soon as they arrive. Not only does it seem, as it were, very, very difficult in that outline form, but the team itself comprised largely a group of people, some six people, who were going to set up a headquarters in the capital city, Salisbury, as it was then called, Harare. Now, two of us were going to conduct a reconnaissance of the entire country and set up the observation in a country which is not a small country. You're looking at a very large country and the area to which I was assigned was the size of England. So you're having, as it were, an improvisation which worked. Basically, when you look at election observation today, it's entirely derivative from what we made up extemporaneously on the spot in January 1980. We had no idea what we were doing. We just got seriously lucky. And we got seriously lucky that although observer members came under fire from time to time because the ceasefire that we were also meant to be monitoring was not in fact a complete success although they came under fire from time to time there were no casualties and thankfully no fatalities so that the election was conducted at all and led to the sweeping result that certainly the british did not foresee they were hoping for a different result anyone but mugabe was plain to us on the ground it was going to be Mugabe all the way. The popular sentiment behind a man who had fought for them was absolutely palpable. If you were locked up in Salisbury as Governor Soames representing British interests was, you wouldn't get any of this. The minute you stepped outside, you got this in your face, even in areas where there had been a different liberation group fighting, not his they were going to accept a result because they could tell that the rest of the country was falling in behind the Mugabe campaign. They hoped to be able to broker some kind of power sharing, of course, for their leader, Joshua and Como, but basically anyone but a continuation of the white regime underneath E.M. Smith. When you had conditions of that sort, in other words, you had an election which had such high hopes attached to it, with so much improvisation in terms of trying to demonstrate that it was free and fair, and with a historical outcome very, very much desired, helping to complete the independence process in the English-speaking part of Southern Africa. Only South Africa would remain after that that you had, as it were, a huge amount of tangibilities resting on something which was essentially an intangible series of hunches. Now, what they've tried to do since then in order to overcome the intangibility of hunches is to bureaucratize the process. So observer teams today do exactly what we do, but they write it all down on special forms. It becomes a checklist exercise. Nothing new takes place. And this poses a certain problem, because if you've got clean checklists at polling station after polling station, uh, then what you've got is, in fact, nothing more than a bureaucratic clean bill of health. You're not making any kind of real comment 
of the tangibility of democratic practice in terms of the possibility of people being able to express their will and perhaps even change the government. Those kinds of things are very, very difficult to express on a checklist way of looking at things. And even more to the point now, when we've come to an era where everything is no longer just dependent on manual counting of paper ballots, but even in those countries that use paper ballots, and in fact, there's a fair degree of electronic voting now, something which makes our practices here in Great Britain extremely primitive. You know how it is. You go to a polling booth here with your little paper card, which has been sent to you in the post, and the clerk at the polling station checks off your name on a paper list with a pencil. You're given another pencil and piece of paper and told to go into the booth and make your choice. And you put it into a box afterwards. And it's all counted by hand afterwards. But if this is all done, or at least done partly, or in certain areas at least electronically, what you've got is the addition of an entirely new dimension. And you've also got the introduction of the particular importance of the Electoral Commission. Because even if party agents are able to post what they call parallel voter tabulations outside each polling booth that they're able to be present at, and compare their own tabulations with the official announcement of results at that particular polling station, then all of these results, in any case, have got to be sent to the headquarters of the National Electoral Commission. Their little bit of fine tuning could be enough to alter the national result. Now, what this means is something very, very simple. That is, if there's a huge swing in one direction, then let us say that manipulating the algorithms is not going to be easy. It might be possible, but it's not going to be very convincing necessarily. If there's just a tiny divergence in terms of the results that come in, that tiny divergence can be manipulated in favor of whoever the electoral commission is serving, often, most often, the incumbent government. So you saw this very, very much at work in the Zambian elections of 2016, which I attended and which I observed. And both of the two main parties, the government and the opposition, in their own opinion polling before the elections had a margin of victory of just 2%. Neither side was claiming a victory that was on the cards of more than 2% which meant that all you had to do was to basically manipulate the results in the Electoral Commission with a tiny percentage within a margin of error. It's all within the 5% margin of error. And you had a result, hey presto, and lo and behold, that's exactly what happened. Uh, the European Union observers with whom I was talking marked the exact moment when it was likely to happen when the Electoral Commission lock them out of the final adjudication process. And that's probably when the final count was, let us say, very slightly adjusted. So the government won by, wait for it, 2%, just under 2%, in fact. And you knew that something was going on as the results came in, constituency by constituency. Now, the story of that election, from my point of view, is that I arrived at the Pamodzi Hotel. I've just come up from Zimbabwe, for instance, where there was another set of, let us say, not fully free and fair sort of political practices going on, not related to an election this time. I arrived at the Pamodzi Hotel, which is a luxury hotel. And basically I stay there, particularly during election times, because the electoral observation groups stay there. So I'm conducting industrial espionage finding out what they're finding out, if anything, checking on their methodologies, if there are any new methodologies, and none of them had brought an IT expert, an algorithm expert with them, particularly not the African Union groups that were basically wedded to the kind of 
observation practice that I had helped pioneer so many years ago in 1980. So what I did, I asked the porters to take my bags to my room because so I was exhausted and I went straight to the bar and I burst out laughing because a number of people that were very well known to me and from other incarnations of my life were sitting at the bar drinking whiskey. So my whiskey came and I went and sat down with them and I said, well, look, since we're all here together as tourists, of course, we might as well share our data and our information. Uh, how do I put this in a polite way? Well, they were spies, of course. They were there doing political intelligence. In other words, governments don't just rely on the public observer groups. They've got people who know how to do stuff, who are there on an informal basis sending back alternative reports as to what is really going on. And they had come with their computers and their computer programs. They could track the algorithms. So that was all well and good, but we still had to have some local knowledge. So I provided the local knowledge. So the key was to find, particularly in Lusaka, the capital city where we were headquartered, constituencies that represented the same group of people. In other words, for example, if we went down, or if I went down to Kapwata district, a suburb, Kapwata, which had been divided into two constituencies. Okay, this is not uncommon. It happens here all the time. For instance, London suburbs get, as it were, assigned to different constituencies. Kapwata is two constituencies, but the population of Kapwata is ethnically the same throughout. In socioeconomic terms, it's exactly the same throughout. In terms of employment and unemployment numbers, that's common throughout. In terms of gender spread, ethnic spread, by that I mean not just black and white, it's largely black, but I mean in terms of the different ethnic groups in Zambia, it's completely even. And their voting history was completely even. Like, but you have to know all of this. You had to have a feel for the area and you had to be familiar with the voting maps from the past. So I went down and anchored myself in Cap Water. And as soon as we saw that there was a divergence of results coming in from the two constituencies, I was basically able to alert immediately the spooks back in the hotel. Look, this is where it's happening. This shouldn't be like that. Okay. They should have symmetrical results. And basically, at that point in time, we knew the fix was on, and they were fixating on suburbs like Capwater, not on everything, not on every single constituency, selected constituencies to deliver the result that they wanted for their government. And then with the adjustment of the algorithms at the end, when the observers were locked out of the final adjudication on the part of the Electoral Commission, the fix went in, and it was very subtle. Of course, what happened was that at that precise moment in time, the website announcing the results collapsed, didn't it? With a very plausible claim that too much traffic was taking place. And of course, when websites went back up a few hours later, uh, the result was pretty much what the government had wanted. And they could claim it was all within a margin of error, nothing fraudulent, no one wins by 90% anymore. You just want to win. Now, if the opposition runs up a huge head of steam so that it's not 2%. If, as in the following, the more recent Zambian election, the opposition is polling in the opinion polls of everybody, including foreign pollsters, a good 10% ahead, you can't fix it. And that, of course, is precisely what happened in Zambia very recently and why there was a change of government. And Hakeemdi Hachlema became the new president because he won by 10%. And that was beyond the subtle adjustment of algorithms. And not only that, but in the case of Zambia and in the case of Malawi beforehand, when the presidents, the incumbent presidents turned to the military saying, is there any way we can fix this? Let me stay in power type of thing. I would need your support. In both cases, the military said, no, we're going to stay by the Constitution. So there are actors behind the scenes that are absolutely critical to the entire process. This includes the military. 
the power of the state, for instance. Will the power of the state abide by the constitution that is meant to determine who is the government of the state? Happened also in Nigeria some few years before. Good luck, Jonathan was obviously cruising to a defeat at the hands of Buhari, who became the president. He locked himself in conclave with his advisors. They contemplated all kinds of scenarios by which he could cling to power, saying the election had been fraudulent. In the end, after taking advice from many people, including, as I understand it, the military, he understood that he had to concede defeat. And Buhari became the president. So you had, in all of these cases, a reluctant but a grudging, inevitable acceptance of the will of the people. But the will of the people had to be expressed in such large terms. In other words, you're only going to win if the majority is huge. This is what is facing the young challenger to President Minagagwa in Zimbabwe right now. We're on the eve of by-elections. The leader of the opposition, Nelson Chamisa, has had to form a new party because the government has been playing shenanigans and arranged for a rival opposition party to win court cases so that he no longer was able to use his old name, the old name of his party, no longer able to use the headquarters and the bank accounts of his old party. He had to start from scratch. And he only did this, he only made up his mind reluctantly to do this a very, very short time ago, uh, just two or three weeks ago from when I'm speaking now. And began attracting huge crowds to his rallies. After the success of his first big rally, the government arranged for the police to start beating up people at all the subsequent rallies. So you have, as it were, a determination on the part of the current Zimbabwean government not to allow any opposition challenge to pick up steam. And these are only by-elections. They don't mean very much in terms of the national picture that might emerge next year when national elections are being held. They're a dress rehearsal as to how much you can get away with, how much you can stand in the face of intimidation, what kind of international support you can gather, where you can make alliances, including reaching out to perhaps objective members of the security forces, perhaps, or by offering inducements to elements of those military forces by saying, you'll get amnesties afterwards if we win. And of course, there's something that can't really be factored in very easily. And that is, there's an age, an age variable here now in Zimbabwe. Minagagwa, the people around him, the senior generals are all from the liberation era, although some of them were remarkably young fighters at that point in time when independence came in 1980. It's 32 years since then. You're going to be in your late 50s. And of course, Minagagwa himself is in his 70s. You've got a whole generation born since 1980. You've got a whole generation born able to vote who are millennials. They don't know anything about anti-colonial rhetoric. You know, when you talk about decolonization, we'd like to decolonize the existing regime, please, so that we can have something modern. The existing regime doesn't seem able to field anything modern except forms of corruption. The age variables might be such that a new generation provides Nelson Chamisa and his new party with the majority that he needs if everyone is not beaten to death before then. So this is something to watch. But what it means, of course, with all of these variables at play is something very, very simple. And that is when we talk about a free and a fair election. Look, there's no such thing. The previous United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon came up with the alternative formulation, peaceful and credible peaceful so that people are not being beaten to death, credible so that people are not stealing an election by fixing it by more than 10%, which means that there's not too much protest when you fix it by 2%. 
it's a credible exercise, even if there's a whole range of variables that you could start discussing. And my own memorandum you know, to governments who send observer groups is simply that, look, there has to be even a greater range of variables. You've got free and fair, you know, not totally possible, if at all possible, peaceful and credible, which means that there's the real possibility of getting away with something, but not by a staggering margin. It's all within a margin of error, even if that margin of error uh, was verging on the edge of implausibility. Which brings us to my next category. Uh, you could have, after peaceful and credible, an election result that is plausible but problematic. And I would apply that in a huge number of African elections. Plausible but problematic. It's getting really bad, as it was in Gabon, for instance, to be not fully plausible, which was my next category. We go on, my next category after that is to be implausible. And only after that do I come to a category, a guillotine category that says to be unacceptable. In other words, you've got fudge room all around. If you can make it to free and fair, that's not gonna happen peaceful and credible, which is what most governments would aim for. If you can even scrape in a plausible but problematic, and I've laid down what all of these mean in uh, a published version of the memorandum I sent to governments around the world. Uh, I'll give you the link to that. I think I put it up on the BLE anyway, but in any case, it's published in this journal, the Journal of African Elections, volume 18, number one of 2019, if you can make it to plausible but problematic, at least you're in the frame being able to explain away the problems. If you go much beyond that, if you've fixed it beyond that, then you really do have a big problem, not least in public relations, but certainly also in terms of acceptance, even on the part of neighboring African governments. Which is why, in many, many cases, the temptation not even to contest elections was simply launch a military coup on the part largely of younger officers. That seems once again to become becoming fashionable, particularly in francophonic parts of Africa. Thankfully, not in the southern part of Africa, nor in the eastern part of Africa. We've got a volatility here. Now, my very good colleague, formerly at the University of Oxford, now at the University of Birmingham, Nick Cheeseman, uh, published a book with one of his own colleagues with the very, very, as it were, inciting, in, is insightful, but it's also inciting to a certain amount of controversy, how to rig an election. And it made him, as it were, quite famous, notorious, a lot of money as well, I hasten to add, maybe I'm just jealous. So Nick basically says that all the preconditioning effectively rigs the election before it's even held. Now, I would contest that to a certain extent. It's certainly an attempt to rig the election before it's even held. But it's also, as it were, a battleground in which you can't, short of assassinating, imprisoning, or in some way fully restricting the activities of the opposition leaders, there's still room for maneuver and fight back and the building of alliances and particularly support within civil society and support in the external world. Where this becomes, as it were, absolutely clear that it's not possible, such as in Uganda, where the opposition basically seems to spend most of its campaigning time in prison, where it's not clear in a country like Rwanda, but there are, let us say, all kinds of other factors there where a strong man ensures he stays to power despite all his opponents being in jail, but sometimes according to Western sources, with some veracity because keeping him in power, Kagame, is a guarantee of sorts against a return to the terrible bloodshed of the genocide despite all kinds of efforts to harmonize society since the terrible events of the mid-1990s. 
is not yet a fully united society. And many of those who participated, who caused the genocide back then, have found refuge in surrounding countries, particularly the lawless parts of Democratic Republic of Congo, right on the doorstep of Rwanda. So you have, as it were, difficulties in terms of, okay, this of a free and fair playing field, where in some countries that may not be fully desirable. In other words, what you've got is the problematic of elections causing violence rather than serving democracy. In other words, what if the campaigning in an election becomes so volatile, so very, very, very violent, that <coughs> sorry, harm is done rather than good. This happened in Kenya, 2007. Sorry, I, I hasten to assure you that's cough mixture, not anything stronger. Where ethnic militias suddenly took to almost every single district of Kenya to contest violently what seemed to be the results being announced by the Electoral Commission. And that had been rehearsed and prepared beforehand by the party leaders. It took Kofi Annan in terms of his intervention immediately afterwards mandated by the African Union to sort that out. And he sorted it out in terms of a power sharing government. Now, all of our opinion polls before the election was that the opposition should have won it. What happened with the power sharing brokered by Kofi Annan, the former UN Secretary General, was that the incumbent president stayed president, the opposition leader who should have been president became prime minister. A power sharing regime was agreed for the sake of peace. Okay, so then that raises a very, very key question. Is peace a greater value than democracy? And some would say so. If you're being beaten to death or if you've had people close to you beaten to death, you would say so. The following year in 2008 in Zimbabwe, which is really the pioneer of what we see with manipulation of the algorithms now, but which is done manually, what you had was also violence, but it was quite clear and I was in Zimbabwe for all stages of this. It was quite clear the opposition leader, Morgan Chagarai, who since died of cancer, was going to win the presidency. In fact, my polling had about 96%, and not 96, 56%. Um, even South African broadcasting had about 52%. And it was very, very clear that there should have been a change in government. Violence erupted, of course. The government forced a second round by protracted manual counting down of the vote, what is now able to be done overnight in terms of algorithms. They did it manually. It's said with the help of consultants from Israel. We've got no real evidence of that, but there are firms advertising themselves quite openly in Israel. If you read the code of their advertising, who claim to be able to help you in situations of this sort, a certain form of problem solving. Into this meltdown, after this manual counting down, came not Kofi Annan, but Thabo Mbeki, the former president of South Africa. And following Kofi Annan's example in Kenya, basically forced the power sharing government upon Zimbabwe. So the President Mugabe should have lost the presidency, remained president, and Morgan Changarai, who should have been president, became the prime minister. This is not constitutional. There was no such position of prime minister in the Zimbabwean constitution. It was pretty much, as it were, uh, an extemporaneous fix, which then, as it became the legal status, but it wasn't constitutional. So a big problem there. Whereas Kofi Annan worked underneath the question mark, 
is peace a greater value than democracy? And he chose peace. Tabo and Becky worked underneath the basic principle. This is my analysis in any case of is inclusivity, is being included a greater value than democracy where some get excluded? You know, the winner takes all, the loser gets nothing. If everyone is there sharing the cabinet, for instance, and of course there's a huge argument as to who got what portfolios in the cabinet, who got how many seats, etc., etc., etc. But is not inclusiveness of value that is reminiscent of some of the wider communitarian values of Ubuntu, for instance, the South African derived communitarian philosophy of precisely inclusiveness. Uh, we're all part of a community. But this raises a huge question. Does opposition politics, does parliamentary politics, does democratic politics in itself, because you've got some people on one side and other people on another side, is that against the basic philosophy which is meant to be representing a certain, as it were, decolonized reclamation of African values? Does this mean that you can't have, we could only have democracy underneath very, very limited conditions that you've got to accept underneath this kind of rubric of this particular interpretation of Ubuntu? Well, I don't think so. I think inclusiveness is very well and good, but if you're going to have elections at all, then what you've got to have is some sense of the ability to change government, as has happened in Zambia, as has happened in Ghana, not just a government changing, not just a new leader of the same old party, but a new political party with a new leader. That's happened on a few occasions in Africa, as I said, Ghana and Zambia, particularly Zambia. It doesn't very often happen. So that, for instance, although you've had changes of leaders in South Africa, you've had Mandela, you've had Mbeki, you've had Zuma, now you've got Ramaphosa, they're all from the same party, aren't they? So they may bring different personalities, a different style, maybe even a different set of policies, but the same people same entrenched interests, same patronage chains. So major problems exist here. An end of violence, a desire for inclusiveness, an effort to decolonize Western values so that at least there is a, an equal place that is shared by so-called African values, which as we've discussed before in this course are not always fully articulated or fully agreed. What place then for the kind of politics that we associate in Western jurisdictions? Robust opposition, free and fair elections, not that we've actually seen those without controversy recently in the United States of America, for instance. And not that we've seen free and fair elections even in this country without, as it were, a plenitude of lies, distortions, falsehoods, and absolutely ridiculous claims that purport to be veracity. And who funds the parties? The government using a majority of its funding to basically promote its own political party, the one that's in power. The opposition does it get any of the public purse? Is it reliant on foreign donors? What's the power of the foreign donors? It's a question which is often dismissed. It's a real question, however. And what about alternative models? The African debate on alternative models is not very, very persuasive, I hasten to add. It just can't be, as it were, old fashioned, traditional village communities. If you're going to have that kind of ethos, then you've got to go Swiss, you've got to go Estonian to make it something which is nationally meaningful. You better wire up the country, have it all transparent, and all done as popular democracy expressed electronically. It's not a case of looking back. It's a case of taking values from the past and going forward. That's not going to happen because most of Africa is not very wired up. It could be, but right now it certainly isn't. So prospects for the future. Well, we're in a 
moment of hiatus. We're locked in, as it were, something which is not going forward, something which is trying to confront the difficulties of the recent past. You've got class interests now, whereas before, as I've said to you, I've contested an existence of class on the basis of something that can be analyzed along Western lines. Increasingly, we are able to see class formations, particularly as some African countries begin to enter into middle income status. And you've got class interests, particularly of an oligarchic nature. This is always part of the dependencia, dependency analysis in any case, the oligarchs, those who are part of elite accumulation at the top of the national tree and we feed into an international elite accumulation. This is one of the key reasons that keeps the Zimbabwean government in power. It's alliance with the oligarchic class. It's alliance and infiltration in terms by the military class. There's not very much evidence of any general in Zimbabwe who's not filthy rich. So you have, as it were, that kind of class interest. It's patronage chains, which can do some good because if the government fails in formal terms, your average citizen is going to be dependent on informal terms of being able to access, if not patronage, at least some kind of help. And of course, even if you don't have access to elite accumulation by being 15th cousin of somebody in power, you're dependent on a family member who's made it to Europe and is sending home remittances. What you've got is dependency all the same on informal means of assistance. Can this be recognized as part of the political equation? in problematic African countries, that it's something which should be recognized and incorporated in some way into the system. It will take some imagination to be able to do that. So basically, ladies and gentlemen, as I said, we're at a hiatus, many questions, not too many solid answers right now. The by-elections in Zimbabwe this month, March, are gonna be very, very interesting. The clips coming out of Zimbabwe right now show the young man Nelson Chamisa attracting crowds or having his crowds bullied and tear gassed to death almost by government forces. They're in the cities. Will this translate into the rural areas where he's not had much chance to organize, where he's not had any kind of apparatus put into place? Can an election be won entirely on the urban vote? Does this bespeak in itself a divided country between urban and rural polities? Those questions have yet to be fully addressed. But the results of the by-elections will be very interesting in any case. It would seem that with all the government obstacles and the lack of funding at his disposal, that Chamisa is not going to be able to organize a national party machine that can guarantee access, penetration, and full-scale campaigning in all parts of the country for the 2023 elections. Which means that he's probably not going to be able to win parliament. The party, his party, the Citizens Coalition for Change, as it's called, the CCC, will not be able to win parliament. Can he win the separate presidential vote? Can he then govern as a president without the support of parliament? Underneath the constitution, yes, but with some difficulty. The same kind of difficulty is that confront President Biden if he loses control of Congress. He needs Congress. So this brings into the frame, the final question. Can you have a bifurcated set of results from a democratic practice that in fact leads to instability. A person from one party wins the presidency, the other party wins Congress, wins parliament, wins the legislature. It works in France where the president is so powerful, but no other country in any part of the democratic world has a presidency as constitutionally powerful as the French president. In certain respects, he might as well be a dictator. So you don't have that in Zimbabwe. In fact, you don't have that in any African 
country. No African president, except dictators who have seized power and suspended democracy. No African president is as powerful as the French president. So having to put up with a divided government, executive on the one hand, legislature on the other, does this exercise in democracy, which has led to a bifurcated result, is that helpful to an Africa that has tried to emerge into a peaceful, and if not a peaceful, a stable future for economic development to take place, for instance, there has to be stability, at least. This is the whole basis of what the Chinese claim to be the success of their miracle. Everywhere there is tumult under heaven, but in China, there is stability, even if that stability is brought at the price of suppressing whole groups of people, vast swathes of people. So, ladies and gentlemen, I've tried to make some statements about the problematics of election observation, about the problematics of elections in themselves, some problematics even about democracy. Having said all of that, if you've got to make a choice between a democracy and a dictatorship, well, quite frankly, I know which I would choose. I know what the citizens of Ukraine right now, as we speak, would choose. And the question, of course, that is put to you is, which would you choose? So thank you very much. And I look forward to our being able to resume face-to-face -face contact, contact and robust discussion about these and the subsequent themes in this course on politics in Africa. My thanks to you all.